The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, Part 1. As I said in my previous video, the script for this was kind of going on fairly long, so I kind of wanted to break it into three parts. And it might end up being four. We'll see. Uh, this also deals uh, with how I want to format video, my videos and content, my content going forward. Uh, I'm going to make a video sort of explaining that. Uh, hopefully it's going to release shortly after this one. Um, just kind of my general goals for the channel. But to dive right in, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk would end up having vast-reaching consequences, not only for the Russian Revolution, but for the whole of the 20th century. Uh, within Russia, it would show splits within the Bolshevik Party. It, it results in the left SR party no longer working with the Bolsheviks, as well as the attempted assassination of Lenin that would result in his er early death years later. The powers of the Czech are increased. Uh, the lost territories, especially losing Ukraine especially, results in a great deal of hunger gripping the young Soviet Republic. It as well sets the standard for how the treaties for World War I would go and heavily influence the Treaty of Versailles. This is the first time that socialists in power had to answer questions of foreign policy. How exactly should a worker state handle diplomacy with bourgeois powers? The day following the October Revolution, November 8th, an announcement that went out with the new government's intentions regarding peace. And I'm going to read the whole peace declaration. It is rather long, and so I'm kind of sorry that it's going to boost up the length of the video, but I kind of really wanted to include it. Um, I'll try to put in the description a button to skip it if you really don't care about the full text of the decree on peace. The Workers' and Peasants' Government, created by the Revolution of November 6th through 7th, drawing its strength from the Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies, proposes to all warring peoples and their governments to begin at once negotiations leading to a just and democratic peace. A just and democratic peace for which the great majority of weary, tormented, and war-exhausted toilers and the laboring classes of all belligerent countries are thirsting. A peace which the Russian workers and peasants have so loudly and insistently demanded since the overthrow of the Tsar's monarchy. Such a peace the government considers to be an immediate peace without annexations, i.e. without the seizure of foreign territory and forcible annexation of foreign nationalities and without indemnities. The Russian government proposes that all warring people that this kind of peace be concluded at once. It also expresses its readiness to take immediate and without the least delay all decisive steps pending the final confirmation of all terms of such a peace by the plenipotentiary assemblies of all countries and all nations. By annexation or seizure of foreign territory, the government, in accordance with the legal concepts of democracy in general and of the working class in particular, understands any incorporation of a small and weak nationality by a large and powerful state without a clear and definite and voluntary expression of agreement and desire by the weak nationality, regardless of the time and when such a forcible incorporation took place, regardless also of how developed or how backwards the nation forcibly attached or forcibly detained within the frontiers of the larger state, and finally, regardless whether or not this large nation is located in Europe or in distant lands beyond the sea, if any nation whatsoever is detained by force within the boundaries of another state, and if that nation, contrary to its expressed desire, whether such desire is made manifest in the press, national assemblies, party relations, or in protest and uprising against national oppression, is not given the right to determine the form of its state life by free voting completely free from the presence of troops of the annexing and stronger state, without the least pressure, then adjoining of that nation by the stronger state is annexation, i.e. seizure by force and violence. The government considers that to continue this war simply to decide how to divide the weak nationalities among the poor and rich nations which has seized them would be the greatest crime against humanity. It solemnly announces its readiness to sign at once the terms of peace which will end the war on the indicted conditions, equally for all nationalities without exception. At the same time, the government declares that it does not regard the conditions of peace mentioned above as an ultimatum. That is, it is ready to consider any other condition, insisting, however, that such a proposed by the any belligerents as soon as possible and that they be expressed in the clearest terms, without ambiguity or secrecy. The government abolishes secret diplomacy, expressing for its part the firm determination to carry on all negotiations absolutely openly and in view of all the people. It will proceed at once to publish all secret treaties ratified or concluded by the government of landlords and capitalists from March to November 7th, 1917. All these provisions of these secret treaties, and so far as they have been their object, the securing of benefits and privileges to the Russian landlords and capitalists, which was true in a majority of cases in retaining or increasing the annexation by the great Russians, their government declares absolutely and immediately nulled. 
While addressing to the governments and peoples of all countries the proposal to begin at once peace negotiations, the government, for its part, expressed its readiness to carry on these negotiations by written communications, by telegraph, by parlays of representatives of different countries, or at a conference of such representatives. To facilitate such negotiation, the government appoints its plenipotentiary representatives to neutral countries. The government proposes to all governments and peoples of all belligerent countries to conclude an armistice at once. At the same time, it considers it desirable that this armistice should be concluded for a period of not less than three months. That is, a period during which it would be entirely possible to complete the negotiations for peace with the participants and representatives of all peoples and nationalities which were drawn into the war or forced to take part in it, as well as call on the plenipotentiary assemblies of people's representatives in every country for the final ratification of peace terms. In making these peace proposals to the government and peoples of all warring countries, the provisional government of workers and peasants of Russia appeals particularly to the class-conscious workers of the three most advanced nations of mankind, who are also the largest states participating in the present war. England, France, and Germany, the workers of these countries have rendered the greatest possible service to the cause and progress of socialism by the great example of the Chartist movement in England, several revolutions of universal historic significance accomplished by the French proletariat, and finally the historic struggle against the law of exemptions in Germany, a struggle which was prolonged, stubborn, and disciplined, which could be held up as an example for the workers of the whole world, and which aimed for the creation of a proletarian mass organizations in Germany, all three examples of proletarian heroism and historic achievements serve us as a guarantee that the workers of three countries will understand the tasks which lie before them by way of liberating humanity from the horrors of war and its consequences, and that by their resolute and unselfish energetic efforts in various directions, these workers will help us to bring to a successful end to the cause of peace, and together with this, the cause of the liberation of toiling and exploited masses from all forms of slavery and all forms of exploitation. The workers and peasants government created by the revolution of November 6th through 7th and drawing its strength from the Soviets of workers and soldiers and peasants deputies must begin peace negotiations at once. Our appeal must be directed to the governments as well as to the peoples. We cannot ignore the governments because this would delay the conclusion of peace, a thing which the people's government does not dare to do. But at the same time, we have no right to not appeal to the peoples. Ever where government and peoples are at arm's length, we must therefore help the peoples to take in hand settling the question of peace or war. We shall, of course, stand by our program of peace without annexations and without indemnities. We shall not relinquish that program, but we must not deprive our enemies of the possibility of saying that their conditions are different and they do not wish, therefore, to enter negotiations with us. No, we must dislodge them from that advantageous position by not presenting them our conditions in the form of an ultimatum. For this reason, we have included a statement to the effect that we are ready to consider any condition of peace, in fact, every proposal. Consideration, of course, does not necessarily mean acceptance. We shall submit the proposals for consideration to the Constituent Assembly, which will then decide officially what can and what cannot be done. We have to fight against the hypocrisy of the governments, which, while talking about peace and justice, actually carry on wars of conquest and plunder. Not one single government will tell you what it really means. But we are opposed to secret diplomacy and can afford to act openly before all people. We do not now close or have ever closed our eyes to the difficulties. Wars cannot be ended by refusal to fight. They cannot be ended by one side alone. We are proposing an armistice for three months, though we are not rejecting a shorter period in the hope that this will give the suffering armies at least a breathing space and will make the possibility of calling the popular meetings in all civilized countries to discuss the conditions of peace. This decree was passed unanimously, and on its passing, the delegates sang the chorus of the international. At this point, however, there was not yet a department of the government set up to conduct diplomacy. On the morning of November 9th, the All-Russian Central Executive Committee of the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets Elected to this committee were 62 Bolsheviks, 29 left SRs, and 6 Menshevik internationalists, and 4 from other minor leftist groups. From this body, the first Soviet of People's Commissars would be created. People were elected to this to oversee the various commissariats. The composition of this body were as follows. Vladimir Lenin, Chairman. Leon Trotsky, Foreign Affairs. Alexei Rykov, Internal Affairs. Vladimir Milyutin, Agriculture. Alexander Shopnikov, Labor. Viktor Nogin, Industry and Commerce, Anatoly Lunacharsky, Education, Nikolai Krylenko and Pavel Dybinko for Army and Navy, Orgy Opakov for Justice, Ivan Stepanov, Finance, Ivan Tidiorovich, Food, Nikolai Avilov, Post and Telegraph, Joseph Stalin, Nationalities, Alexandra Kolontai for Social Welfare, 
uh, the first person who can put in the comments and tell me how many of those I definitely mispronounced, I'll pin it at the top. I think that's a thing on YouTube, right? Anyway, given we're going to talk a great deal about the Commissariat of Foreign Affairs, I think it is fitting we go into how Trotsky got the position. Lenin originally proposed that Trotsky be put at its head, as Lenin wanted to focus on important party matters. This was turned down by Trotsky, as well as many other members of the government. Trotsky was then offered to be put in charge of internal affairs. However, he refused this position due to him being Jewish. Trotsky's exchange with Lenin shows this. This is a quote from, from Trotsky's uh, autobiography. Was it worthwhile to put into our enemy's hands such an additional tool as my Jewish origin? Lenin almost lost his temper. We're having a great international revolution. Of what importance are such trifles? A good-humored bickering began. No doubt the revolution is great, I answered, but there are still a good many fools left. But surely we don't keep step with the fools. Probably we don't. But sometimes one has to make allowances for stupidity. Why well, create additional complications at the outset? Yakov's Federlov, the secretary of the Bolshevik party, agreed with Trotsky that it might not be best to have someone who is Jewish in charge of internal affairs. He would propose that Trotsky become foreign secretary. Trotsky accepted, stating, What diplomatic work are we apt to have now? I will issue a few revolutionary proclamations of the people of the world and then shut up shop. This was incredibly overly optimistic, but not exactly an uncommon view at the time. Lenin had remarked this, but not a few weeks earlier. If the Russian Revolution were to pass from impotent and pitiful yearning for peace to a forthright peace offer coupled with the publications and annulments of secret treaties, etc., there is a 99 chance in 100 that peace would quickly follow, that the capitals would be unable to stand in the way of peace. The day following the revolution, Trotsky was in charge of the People's Commissariat of Foreign Affairs, though very quickly it was becoming clear that Trotsky was a commissar without a commissariat, as he met great resistance from the government employees carried over from the provisional government. A week after his appointment, Trotsky, after being busy dealing with the remainders of Kerensky's troops, Trotsky traveled with Mark and a Kronstadt sailor and a close friend of his to the offices. Their primary goal to locate all the treaties and diplomatic cables conducted by the czarist and provisional government so that they could be published. Initially denied access to the keys of the safes after two days of arrests, so the officials gave in and handed them over. They released the documents confirming everything the Bolsheviks had accused the government of. The war was being fought over to conquer Galicia, Constantinople, and further dominate the Balkans. They also showed that the Entente wanted a dismantling of the dual monarchy. The same day, a proposal was sent to the Allied governments to propose a ceasefire to the German command as well as open up peace talks. Another similar letter was addressed to the diplomatic representatives of neutral states requesting their assistance in bringing about the peace proposal. A review of the situation with foreign governments was given to the central executive of the Soviets. The first reaction of the Germans was ambivalent. As Germans, they rejoiced at the offer of peace. As conservatives, they were afraid of the revolution, which was making the offer. Officially, Britain was unmistakably hostile. The French were war-weary, but the petit bourgeoisie of France considers us a government allied to the German Kaiser. Italy responded enthusiastically, the United States tolerantly. There was also hope that the German Social Democrats would be able to obtain access to their diplomatic safes and publish their secret treaties, so the world could see that German imperialism and its syndical banditry was in no way inferior to the banditry of the Allies. The Allied ambassadors at a conference on November 22nd because they felt that the Soviet government in Russia was illegitimate, they would not acknowledge the decree of peace or the new government. At the same time, Krelenko, the commissar for war, had authorized troops to fraternize with the enemy on all fronts. Lenin broadcast a wireless message to all troops. The matter of peace is in your hands. You will not suffer counter-revolutionary generals to destroy the great cause of peace. You will surround them with a guard in order to prevent lynching unworthy of the revolutionary army and to prevent these generals from avoiding the court that awaits them. At this time, the Entente made a threat to, that Japan would be called upon to attack Russia if a separate peace with Germany was made. General Dukonin, however, was not arrested by his own troops. He rallied his head staff and began producing leaflets calling for a popular government and for soldiers to join him, as well as circulating the threats from the Allies attempting to rally support to coup the Soviet government. At the Smolny Institute, propaganda was produced to combat Dukonin. Do not obey Dukonin. Do not pay attention to his provocations. Watch him and his count group of counter-revolutionaries carefully. While this was happening, the Entente was quickly realizing there would inevitably be a separate peace between Germany and Russia. They began to become very concerned that if their governments did not release Russia from this war, that it could build up animosity towards the Allies and could lead to a Russo-German alliance, which they felt would constitute a perpetual menace to Europe and to Great Britain. It was proposed that Russia be allowed to make a separate peace and attempts be made to keep good relations with the Soviet government. Colonel House, representing the United States, also agreed to this plan. However, the representatives of the Continental Allies shot this plan down. 
Major General Max Hoffman, the gen chief of staff to the commander-in-chief in the east, the general headquarters at Breslotosk was very uninformed on the happenings in Russia. They had some idea that Kerensky had been overthrown and that the Bolsheviks now held power. Eventually, they heard wireless transmissions by an individual they had not yet heard of, Trotsky, calling for peace. We cannot get a clear view of what is happening, wrote Hoffman in his diary on November 21st. Eventually, the Allied governments began to lift the boycott and meet with Trotsky. Trotsky's first demand from the British government was the return of Bolshevik anti-war protesters, specifically Gregory Chichirin, whom Trotsky's request was denied. It was ordered that no British citizen would be permitted to leave Russia until his demands were met. On November 26, Trotsky sent a private message to the Allies. This was done despite condemnations of secret diplomacy. According to Revolution and Survival, the note which Trotsky sent to the representatives is not in the Soviet records, which granted this book is from 1979, so it's before the main opening, but I was unable to find the text of it anywhere. However, we know the reaction to the note. The representatives felt it was a testimony of the ardent desire of Trotsky to enter into a de facto relations with the Allied governments. It, it as well made it clear that they would be determined to negotiate an armistice, even if it led to a separate agreement with Germany. Soviet peace was not going to wait on the Allies. The Russian troops already began to fraternize with the German troops, while Russian planes dropped propaganda for the German troops. Krylenko was ordered south and to send troops to make contact with the Germans. The afternoon of November 26th, troops carrying white flags with buglers made their way across no man's land. A German officer met with them and took them behind the lines. The German military was excited for this day, and armistice would allow them to take troops from the Eastern Front and deploy them to the West, where they were needed for an offensive they were planning to launch before American troops could reach Europe in large numbers. They were made aware the Germans would negotiate, and that the official conversation should begin on November 2nd. November 29th, both the German and Austrian governments declared that the Soviet proposals constituted a basis for negotiations. Again, Trotsky reached out to the Entente diplomats for them to participate in the negotiations. There was no response. December 22nd, the troops under Dukonin mutinied and arrested him. The following day, Krylenko arrived with a reinforcement of Bolshevik sailors. During this time, it was discovered that Dukonin had released Kornilov. Dukonin was placed on a train in which was guarded by Krylenko. However, a mob soon formed uh, made up of the mutinying soldiers who swept Krylenko aside. Dukonin was dragged out, surrounded by the mob, and was beaten. Eventually, a soldier fired two bullets into his body to the cheers of the crowd. All the parties needed to assemble their delegations for negotiations. Formed under Max Hoffman, the chief of staff of the Eastern Front, Baron von Rosenberg representing the German Foreign Office, as well as representatives from Austria, Bulgaria, and Turkey. For the Soviet side, while preparing the delegation, it became important for them to have representatives of the revolution, a worker, a soldier, and a peasant. Though the peasantry part was almost forgotten. The following story appears in Breslatov's The Forgotten Peace. Um, I wasn't able to find other sources that weren't just referencing back to this. However, we'll assume that it's true. Not until they were on their way to the station did the leaders of the delegation realize that the peasant class was unrepresentative amongst them. And as their motor sped through the dark and deserted streets of Petrograd, there was a consternation at this omission. Suddenly, they turned a corner and came across an old man in a peasant's coat, plodding along in the snow carrying a bag. The car stopped. Where are you going, Tuvarish? To the station bear, I mean Tuvarish, replied the old man. Get in, we'll give you a lift, and they sped on. The old man was pl mildly pleased at the unusual attention he received from his new friends, but as they neared the Warsaw station, he began to show signs of worry. This is not the station I need, comrades. I need the Nikolaevsky station. I've got to go beyond Moscow. This would never do, thought Yofa and Kamenev, and they began to question the old man about his politics. I'm a socialist revolutionary, comrades, the slightly disconcerting reply. Everybody in our village is a social revolutionary. A left or right one. Something warned the old man, perhaps it was the tone of his questioner, that he had better not say right. Left comrades, of course, the very leftist. No other requirements were needed for the mandatory representative of the Russian peasantry and was getting near train time. There's no need for you to go to your village, the old man was told. Come with us to brest and make peace with the Germans. A little more persuasion and a little bit more money promised, and the old man agreed. The Soviet delegation was made up of Adolf Yofa, a member of the Central Committee, Lev Kamenev, Gregory Sikolnikov, Lev Karakin, as well as representatives from the peasants, the workers, soldiers, and sailors, several military experts from the ranks of the Russian Armed Forces, and Anastasia Bitsenko, a left SR terrorist. So with the groups assembled, the armistice negotiations started on December 2nd. The Central Powers had already begun preparing an armistice terms to offer to Russia as early as May 1917. 
Max Hoffman was happy to give these generous terms. The Russian armies had disintegrated. His primary goal was the transfer of divisions from to the Western Front. He had already started having already sent 11 divisions west and was planning to send another 12 in December. He proposed that all hostilities be ended and that the military situation be maintained. The Soviet delegation wanted rather than to just sign an armistice to use this to help spread propaganda. Adolf Yofi demanded that the negotiations be made fully public and that Hoffman be willing to have a political debate. Max Hoffman had no respect for these revolutionaries and he would not engage in a public debate with them. However, he did agree that the negotiations could be public. Yofi proposed that the armistice be last six months. Hoffman order offered 28 days, but that could be renewed. Yofi also made the demand that no German troops to be transferred from the Eastern Front to other fronts, or to even be withdrawn to arrest quarters. Even if their governments would not answer the Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks did not want more troops to be sent to the Western Front for a new offensive that would result in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of workers. Hoffman agreed on the condition of except those that were already being moved or that had already received orders to go. The Soviet delegation then had to admit that the Sovnikom had only given permission to sign a general armistice. Hoffman then asked if they had authority to negotiate in the name of all of the Entente. The Soviet government had been barely able to talk to the Western powers, let alone have permission to sign an armistice on their behalf. Adolf Yofa, unable to move forward, asked for a recess though he, so that he would be able to return to Petrograd. He as well proposed that negotiations be moved to Pieskov so that the world press would have freer access than within the fortress of Breslatovsk. Hoffman rejected moving the negotiations, but agreed to a recess and that they would return in two weeks and invite all belligerents in the war to attend. On December 5th, the Bolshevik delegation left to return to Petrograd asking if the Soviet leaders would accept. At this point, the Russian army was no more. Revolutionary propaganda for the German troops was still in the early phases. Copies of the decree of peace, which I read out at the start of this, were given and smuggled into German trenches, but also dropped via airplane onto the trenches. In the foreign office, Trotsky had instituted a press bureau under Karl Radek and a bureau of international revolutionary propaganda under Boris Reinstein, who had John Reed and Albert Williams as assistants. Lenin still remained hopeful that a general peace could be achieved, but he was aware that the peace had was promised and demanded by Russia, and the Sovnikom instructed Yofi to return to Brest-Litovsk and continue negotiations. On December 6th, Trotsky sent out more declarations for the Allied governments, letting them know that progress was being made on an armistice, and that if they did not participate in a general peace, they should give a good reason for why more people would have to shed their blood in this war, as well as that the Soviet government wouldn't recognize any debts unless they came to negotiate a general peace. December 12th, armistice negotiations resumed at brest Within three days, Yofi's return, an agreement had been found. The armistice was to last until January 14th, 1918, with automatic prolegation and less seven days of notice of rupture was given by either party. No troops were to be transferred to the Western Front unless they had already begun to move to the Western Front. Terms of fraternization was that each Russian division would get two to three intercourse centers where each side could send up to 25 unarmed persons. Exchanging of views in newspapers was to be permitted. The exchange of prisoners of war, who were no longer fit to fight, was also agreed upon. Knowing that these men were to be transferred back to their home countries, the Bolsheviks saw a perfect opportunity and dispatched people to give speeches and win over the POWs to socialism. In Moscow, 10,000 German and Austrian prisoners were organized and began active work amongst their countrymen. Hoffman caught on and that troops were ordered to be quarantined when coming from Russia, or they were forced to read patriotic literature and propaganda from pro-war socialists. He then demanded Krylenko end this at once, otherwise he would denounce the armistice. Krylenko agreed that it must be stopped. Once he got out of the meeting, he ordered that all propaganda efforts be doubled. In seven days, the peace negotiations were to start. The future of the young Soviet Republic was at stake. This would result in a great debate within the party where each other's policies of peace or revolutionary war would bring doom to the revolution. This is what I will be covering in part two of this series. So now looking back at the total run length of this video, um, this was split into three parts with the hope that this could become a much shorter video. Um, however, I seem to have accidentally made my longest video yet, where this will probably end up being 26 minutes long. Oops. Hopefully someday I learn how to make shorter videos, but for now I guess all my videos are going to be over 20 minutes, I guess. Well, thanks for watching, and I guess, you know, subscribe since... That's the thing I'm supposed to tell you at the end of videos.